Coming up next on RaceBot TV and iRacing Live, it's the 60 Plus Racing Adventures, live today from Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. Catch all the action next on RaceBot TV and iRacing Live. Good afternoon, Sim Racing fans, and welcome to those of you watching here on YouTube and iRacing Live. This is the 60 Plus Racing Adventures, live today from Mid Ohio Sports Car Course in Ohio. We're getting ready to bring you all the action here. Two races coming up, 20 laps each, and a lot of fun along the way. Cisco Scaramuza alongside Jack Styles to bring you all the action. Jack, we're back. We don't cover these guys every week, but we come along three races during the year, and uh, this is race number two, Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course, the full course. The only thing you have to worry about, don't have to deal with that little bit of a chicane at the beginning, but apart from that, this track, home to the Xfinity Series, IMSA, a lot of different cars race here. IMSA is returning here for 2018, back on the schedule for the first time in quite a few years, I think, Cisco. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see that come here. It's definitely an awesome circuit, and Again, yeah, we see the Xfinity series come here. We've seen lots of iRacing series come here, and it always cracks up. Amazing racing. Also forgot the Indy cars that also run here, but cars heading to the grid right now. We'll quickly, quickly run you through your points as we come into today. Round number six, Stefan Rosgen and Jas van der Ven. It's a tie, a stranglehold at the top of your point standings. 170 points each to them. Bruce Poole sitting third, way back. Oh, about 53 points behind, but that's the point standings coming into tonight. Why don't we run you through your race spot TV starting grid? Stefan Rosgen is the pole right now. Jas van der Ven going to start to his outside. So our two championship leaders on the front row. Then Stephen Carker and Manning Grinnan going to start third and fourth. John Unsby going to start fifth. Sixth going to go to John Morgan. Seventh going to go to Bill Lawrence in that 17 machine. Joe Wren in the 006 is going to start eighth. Knight going to go to Joel Martin. Mike Taylor rounding out your top 10 here, Jack. 11th is going to go to Jared Forrest, and alongside him is going to be John Hill in the number 8 machine. Johnny Raspaldo is going to be lining up 13th with Fred McIntosh in 14th, Bob Kern in 15th, Mark Robertson in 16th, Richard Coulomb in 17th, Amigo de Pasqua in 18th, Kenneth Dummer is going to go 19th, and Jay Frills rounds out the top 20. 21st going to go to Kenneth Baldwin, 22nd to Ralph Kemmerer. 23rd going to go to Michael Key, 24th to Charles Gilly. Michael Goralski is going to start 25th, 26th to Mark Lysen, Pilo Bonacera, 27th, 28th to David Riley. Jose Carlos Campodonico going to start 29th, and last car that did not take a time, Andrew Fiddler is going to have to work his way through this 30 car field. But 13 turns, 2.35 miles. We're already heading through the last couple S's before we take the green flag. Jack, as we come through the final chicane, we thank you for joining us here on Race Spot TV and iRacing Live. The left hander and the green flag's in the air. Roast in on the loud pedal. We got Manning grinning off after the little final corner. Cisco just looks like he got a touch. Ooh, problems already. Starter. Sorry to cut you off. It's the 61, the 117 making contact in the first turn. They fall off the racetrack. Two cars around already. 
Ah, it just looks as though there was a little bit of contact. Didn't see the car on the inside. I don't know who the other driver was. John Morgan and John Unsby there, the 161, the 177. Two guys we usually see up at the front of this series, Cisco. Just managing to get it wrong, and that's not something you'd expect to see from those guys. And also, they've just got to wait for everyone to pass. Now they're going to have to move back up the field. And you also mentioned that Manning Grinton, right as we came to the start finish line, got very loose coming out of the last corner and had to gravel trap the car. It did not go well for the 47, Jack. No, it looks like he got a touch from Stephen Carpenter. He's managed to carry on currently running in third position around three seconds behind the two leaders, uh, Stefan Rosgen and Jos van der Ven. But other than that, it's just not. As we also see, it looks like the 16 car has spun off to Coulomb. It's and going very goes. slowly. And the leader just about spun it as well. Rosgen got very sideways there for a moment. But yes, van der Ven right behind him gave him all the room in the world. And Rosgen was able to hold on to it. Some nearly problems with our championship leaders, but they are able to hold on. And we are now very spread out here, Jack, because I get the feeling all these incidents happening early on, these guys not able to stick with each other, at least right now. Oh, it's all happening on the first lap. The 66 is round as well. Charles Gilly looks like he's had a few issues. He is a long way back, actually, Cisco. He's not had the first lap that anyone's won. He's already half a lap behind. Yeah, that is not good for the number 66 machine. And a lot of incidents earlier on. This is one of the more challenging road racing circuits in the United States. I'd say it's about up there with Laguna Seca in terms of difficulty just because of uh, a lot of the altitude change a lot of off camber on camber corners kind of swapping back and forth so it makes these guys have to make sure they're online because you can get lost in the s's and uh, fall off track if you're not careful look back to the xfinity series that ran here last year in the rain uh for a little more uh look at that but a lot of problems early on for these guys and we'll take a look at the team sitting on top and that's Andrew Fitter or, uh, and Grinnan as well as Friels and Baldwin sitting at the top of the standings. Then you got Fiddler, Poole, McManus and Riley right behind him, the Rusty Nut group and then Hart, Karkner, Martin, Florissen and Gilly, your kind of top three teams then. Then you got Team Morgan, Team Turtles and Team Otto, you're rounding out teams for the rest of the field there but everybody else right now on track at least single file and uh, very spread out the first battle that I'm seeing Jack well there really isn't much oh there's one car off track it's Mark Lee's in the 610 so more cars falling off track early yeah we just seen the number 30 car Mike Taylor as well I believe that was on the broadcast he had a little thing coming through the shoot just a little bit too much and really got away from him and it, I think that is one of the challenging things with this car Cisco, especially because it's a formal car is it relies so Ooh. much on the downforce and yeah go on yeah, it was Jans van der Ven just fell off track as well. The driver of the 167 was sitting in second, had to give up that spot as it was coming off the long straightaway. That right-hander just not able to stay on track, and he falls off and surrenders the second position to Steven Karkner. And this is this is almost feeling like a race at the Nürburgring at this point, Jack. Everybody's just battling to stay on track as we do see the battle between the four and the six right now on screen. Yeah, I guess this place is like the Nürburgring, just with a lot more runoff and a little bit like more forgiving. But Mid Ohio is definitely a difficult circuit, one that I definitely struggle with. We're going to be looking back a little bit further down your field to fourth to or third to fifth position now. It looks like on my time on screen that is going to be Jos van der Ven, Bill Lawrence, Joe Rant, and Joel Martin, all going to be running up there, and they're all running in a nice queue. Little queue at the moment, Cisco, but I expect there to be some position shuffling over the course of the race. Oh, for sure, and Jas van der Ven just trying to recover from that off track, and Lawrence and Wren starting to close in on him, so we'll see if the slipstream comes into effect. This another racetrack here in the 60 Plus Racing Adventures that has a very long straightaway on it. We're on it right now as we're watching Stephen Karkner because that long straightaway, you have a slight right-hander into it, then you've got that kind of almost carousel-esque right-hander at the end of the straightaway that Jans van der Ven fell off on and uh, that turn one of the more challenging ones here because you're coming off such a long straightaway you have to make sure you get your braking zone right because otherwise you're going to end up in uh, China Beach. Yeah I mean this circuit is awfully fun in a GT car because you can just have it sideways around every corner. In a Formula car it's a lot more challenging obviously we, we, as you mentioned Cisco IndyCar does come here and I beg to question how IndyCar drivers get the car around here. I don't even think I could get a skip barb around here without crashing, but 
this place is just such a challenging circuit and it's an awesome place to watch because it does make us look at some awesome battles. We're going to be looking back towards the front of your field. Looks as though it's all spread out a little bit more. The gap between Jos van der Ven and Bill Lawrence is now around a second. Yeah, and very spread out right now. So I think we're going to see some challenges in this race down to the fact that unlike the other races that we've seen, races like Monza and Watkins Glen and that sort of thing, the straightaway comes after, you know, that very complicated, you know, rest of the racetrack. And that really splits your field up because normally on the straightaways, if we think of something like Spa, it's relatively, you know, you don't have this complicated series of S's that spreads the field back out. You usually have a couple of current turns to kind of bring everybody back together. But you come through the carousel, you have the left-hander of turn number one, then the keyhole of turn number two. So it, it kind of, the field has to get each other back kind of through those straightaways. And it's hard to do so in the arrow kits here, just down to the fact that it's, this field's so spread out already. And of course, a lot of that also comes down to the fact that, Jack, that so many cars fall off the racetrack earlier on is a little bit of a battle right now between the seven, the 47s, Grinnin and Florissant going at it right now. Yeah, I mean, this circuit, it's, I mean, all circuits are different, Cisco. You, you look at where we were from round one, we were broadcasting this, uh, this series, we were at Monza, so it's a big draft circuit. Not too many corners, and the ones that there are, they're quite slow speed, some of them are mid-speed. There are no proper high-speed corners, at, like you would see at maybe a Rouge at, um, at Spa. And the circuit we're going to for week 12 of the uh, 60 plus racing adventures is my home circuit. So we're going to Snetterton, but we aren't using the in, in the infield, we're just using the 200 circuit. So it's going to be again long straights, but they do have some very, very challenging corners, that of which I will explain a little bit more when we go there, and I will probably bore Cisco to death. But that circuit I'm extremely looking forward to, it's just seeing how these guys deal with it. Looks like there's also a, a Jos van der Ven. Off four and five. It is Jos van der Ven. Let's go and see what's happened here. He looks like he's just gone too wide again. Yes, he has. Late on the brakes. Yeah, that's turn number four and out into China Beach. That is the official name of that sand trap out there because so many cars have ended up out there and you see it's a long, almost Watkins Glen-esque sort of area out there to catch cars that missed turn number four and that put Jans van der Ven all the way back in ninth position. So the driver tied with our championship leader who's currently leading the race, Stefan Rosgen, falling back to ninth place earlier on. That is not good if he wants to come out of here in the same sort of point standings. No, and he definitely needs to get a good score in the second race. Obviously, this series has changed to how it worked in previous Oop, year, one car in around. previous season. Oh, I've seen Joe two. Ren, 006. And I'm seeing the 645 as well. Uh, that's Fred McIntosh. Let's see what's happened here. The two incidents, the red incident coming through turns number one, and he just loses the back end of that car. And then McIntosh that you saw was coming through going into the carousel turn number 12. So we're having to pay a lot of attention here. A lot of cars going off early on. And just credit to the difficulty of this track, I guess, Jack, because these guys had, have not hit their groove at all. The only one who really has, and we even saw him get loose, was Stefan Rosgen, our leader. I sort of keep a one eye on my track, but one eye on my screen because it actually shows me when his cars have stopped. And oh, we've got another one off on the back. Right, I'm not sure who that is. That is Mark Leeson in the 610 uh, series having for the 60 plus racing adventures. Uh, he's gone wrong out of turn one and has completely cut the keyhole. I, yeah, no, that was turn number one and almost Jay turned the car off the track just to make sure he wasn't blocking racing on track and then cut through the rest of the keyhole. So. Weird things happening today at Mid-Ohio, and uh, one car going backwards, it looks like, is Michael Gor Goralski, who's fallen back a couple positions on this lap alone, but it's it's no rest for the wicked, I guess, right now, Jack, because a lot of drivers not finding a lot of comfort here at Mid-Ohio. One person getting it right, though, Cisco, is uh, Stefan Rosgen. He has a lead now of four seconds. Oh, four and a half seconds over Stephen Cartner. He also has the fastest lap of the race at 1 minute 16.753. The only driver in the 1 minute 16s as their best lap. So he is on fire today, Cisco, and doing extremely well. I expect to see the same thing in race two. Oh, absolutely. And this is a case where I think for Rosegen, it's a case of just make sure you can bring the car back in one piece and you're probably going to be all right. So battle between Florissant 
and uh, Grennan, that's continuing on here. That battle had been going on. We kind of looked away from them because all sorts of stuff broke out on the racetrack, and now they're actually going at it. So keep an eye on those two. Also, a little bit of that battle between Mike Taylor and Michael Key, just swapping positions, the 30 and the 98, just passing each other up, going into the S's section here. And one car spinning off track. That looks to be Fred McIntosh, 645, second time. Yeah, again, same thing, just lost the rear end coming through China Beach and up towards the S's and over the top of the hill. He, he looks like he's rolled back a bit and is trying to keep out the way of everyone else. I uh, don't think there was any contact there with anyone. He is back going again. He... Yeah, definitely having some issues right now. And as we continue to roll on, side-by-side -side action going on between Unsby and Goralski. And Goralski is actually going to lose it going through the carousel once again. The 21 will have to take the grass route. So that's a position gain for John Unsby. And the battling continuing on here. And uh, Goralski going to have to fall back. And now it looks like we'll just have to see where the side-by-side -side action is. It's John Hill. How about John Hill and Bob Curran, the six? And looks like the 80 going at it as they head past China Beach into turn number five here down the hill and it's not going to work for Kern. He'll spin the car out and backwards is the number six machine. So more issues. That was going up that hill, kind of the on camber corner of turn number five right before they get to the S's. He loses the back end and uh, that battle with John Hill is all but uh, absorbed at this point and uh, John Hill now back out nobody around him and uh, the battle that passed him by was actually Jay Friels and Gianni Rispaldo going at it the 91 and the 48 going at it right now it looks like another car falling off the track it's gonna be Florissant this time so he has issues and uh, Joe Wren just in front of him so it's it's these cars it, at this point for these guys if you can keep it on the track you're probably gonna wind up with the top 10 so your top 10 let's let's catch up with them because it's been a while since we've gone through everybody rose jen karkner lawrence your top three really haven't changed a whole lot then you got joel martin manning grinnan yas van der ven and robertson we'll actually keep an eye on them because that's a swap for position right now and uh that's the 43 if i can find it there he is and also, Jas van der Ven going by him. And then behind those guys, Joe Wren, the 006, Florissen, who just fell off the track, and Remigio de Pasqua, the number four. So your top 10. Everybody on track now, at least for the moment. We can catch our breath as it has not been a easy race so far. It hasn't. There's been a lot of action going on, and it just seems to be that everyone's sort of started to settle down now. We've still got 10 laps remaining. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, boys, but... It's definitely been an exciting race so far, Cisco. Lots of action. Yeah, it has, and we can catch our breath a little bit now. So looking through the rest of your field here, not a, the back half of your field very spread out right now because of several issues plaguing multiple different drivers. But for Rose Gen, it's just out to the races, about a six second lead now over Stephen Karkner, who sits second, has a little bit of rear spoiler damage on the number 75, but apart from that, the car looks fairly clean. And back to the not John Player Special, the sort of John Player Special, Bill Lawrence, the number 17 machine, running in that thir third position right now, and a little bit of a battle, Jas van der Ven now getting by, looks like Manning Gritten able to let him go, so Jas van der Ven has been trying to work his way back through this field after the issues with turn number four, and just trying to make up lost time at this point, Jack, he lost so much time between those two incidents, Lo first lost that second place, and now fell back all the way to ninth, but now has worked his way back up to fifth. Next car that he's gonna have to hunt down is gonna be Joel Martin at 27. And he is about a second a lap quicker than Joel Martin as well. So he will be on his tail within the next two, three laps of reckon Cisco. He's probably gonna have enough time maybe to get back up to third position. I think Stephen Kartner's too far down the road in the 75 machine, but Jos van der Ven is certainly on a charge back to the front. He wants all the points he can get. But remember, it's the best point score out of both races that goes towards the championship and not how they used to do it, which was you got you scored points in race one, top three weren't allowed to race in race two. Yeah, and it's a case we're watching right now. The leader stuck behind some lap traffic 
uh, because this field's so spread out, it was actually two cars together. It was Ralph, Kemmer Ralph Kemmerer and uh, Jose Carlos Campo Donigo kind of holding up the leaders. They head down into the S's now, turn number six. You see Rosegen have to use the way outside to get past those two. That's actually a battle position, a battle for position between Carlos Campo Donico and Kemmerer. So those two are going to go at it, and now uh, Charles Gilly going to come onto the scene, and uh, he's, a, I believe, a lap down from these guys, so not quite in this battle. But uh, Steven Karkner is now going to have to find his way past those two, so battle right now going to affect your top three, even though it's not directly for their position. This could also play into the hands of Jos van der Ven, because if he can get traffic at the right point, say down the straight, and everyone else gets it through the tight twisty section, he has a free pass to make up a lot of time, Cisco. And that is going to be interesting to see. Let's see how Stephen Cartner deals with these two guys. They are having an active battle up ahead. Stephen Cartner runs a little bit wide out of turn one, kicking out some dust for the guys behind him. He looks like he's going to go for the outside around the keyhole. Camera is dealt with. Oh, Campo de Nico pushing him wide. And Cartner is in the gravel at the keyhole. He's got back on, but his tyres are going to be dirty. And that means we're going to have to uh, catch these guys back up at the uh, once you go into the S's so Karkner loses all the time that he made up there luckily he doesn't have to worry about Charles Gilly I think the number 66 let him go there so he could catch back up to those guys but I would assume that Karkner's not going to be terribly happy with those drivers in front of him Carlos Campanico just spun off and took Kemmerer with him so never mind and big accident well right this one involving two cars at least in this case and that came out of turn number five at the uh, bottom of china beach and campo de nico uh looks like just tagged camera there and it all went wrong for those guys i would i would say that uh camera could have avoided that he obviously probably would have seen uh jose carlos campo de nico getting on the brakes and I would say actually that's unnecessary damage for the both of them, which is unfortunate to see. Jose uh, Campo de Nico is carrying on, camera has towed back to pit lane, but at the moment everything else looks like it's just going. Steven Kartner then had a free pass to get past then, Cisco. Yes, he did, and that's going to make life a lot easier for him as I'm being corrected in the comments. It's Donico, not Donico, so Italian, not Spanish. I will make that change right now, but everybody else fairly spread out through your field. Martin. And Ias van der Ven being highlighted for me right now because those two fairly close together. We'll keep an eye on the 27 and the 167 because they're close enough. That'll be a good battle here coming up, Jack. I would like it to be a good battle, but I have a feeling Jos van der Ven might just go breezing past John Martin at the end of the straight. I'm not sure. He seems a bit too far back on this lap. Might wait a little bit longer, or he might be going for the outside through China Beach. No, he's going to hang back through the, coming up towards the S's. So this is going to be a good battle to watch. I think our camera needs to stay focused on this because Jos van der Ven has been putting a, up a great fight today. And we can we can also throw a man in Grenin into this battle as well because the 47, not too far off Jos van der Ven either here. So if something gets if Jos gets held up, this could throw the 47 into this battle. We could have a three-way fight for your top four. We could, and that would be interesting as well to see. Uh, Manning Grinning, we know, is fast, uh, and we have seen that all race. We've seen that all season as well, Cisco. So he is definitely one to watch, and he is closing on Jos van der Ver. John Martin is really holding up Jos, and Jos will be getting very impatient at the moment. Jos's best shot's probably going to come on this very long kink straightaway coming up past the keyhole, so these guys will head up. Jos can draft up a little bit here, and then once they get around, it's almost like the straightaway at Monza where you might be better off waiting until that second straightaway to make the actual pass on the car and looks like possible actually it's a little bit of a battle and uh, Jay Friel's possibly getting past a couple of cars and we'll get back to that in a little bit but we got Joe Martin time one yeah no it is actually a little bit of a bad a big battle yeah it is it's uh Respaldo off and uh got a little bit confused on what timing was telling me and it was actually a huge issue going on and it was Florissant who lost the car and got T-boned. So we'll get a replay of that. That was huge. That was huge. Uh, it looks as though J or Jared Florissant just lost it through turn one. Same problems we've seen sometimes with all race, just losing the rear end. He hit the brakes, but didn't get far enough off the circuit. Let me go to pass with just missing him. Ruggiani Raspaldo must have come around that corner and thought, oh dear, this is going to hurt. And he went straight into the side of Jared Florissant, flipping him onto his roll hoop. Yeah, that is a massive incident for those guys. And we'll cut back live here. A little bit of a battle I came back to was Richard Coulomb and Paolo Bonacera, but I am I think we should probably stay with Martin and Vanderven here because that's got to get resolved 
fairly soon because look at the run. Vanderven just got off the corner. Absolutely fantastic run through turn number one. He'll look to the outside heading into the keyhole. He's going to try and clear him here. The outside line going to work for Yas. Vanderven clear to the inside. Joel Martin falls back to fifth and Yas Vanderven continuing to stomp his way through this field. Watch your, keep your eyes on Manning grinning though. He's right on the tailpipe with Joel Martin coming down into China Beach. Joel Martin's going to go outside. Manning Grinnell on the inside. There is a back marker who's just going to get in the way. That could actually Rispaldo. be Rispaldo, who's just, I actually think, man, or just ruined Manning Grinnell's chances of getting past. And he kind of pulled off the track, but just the fact of having that car there probably gave Grinning the impression that he didn't want to make that move then. So, Jas van der Ven, meanwhile, and that's not Bill Lawrence in front of him, so not quite up to the driver of the 17, but is catching him so keep an eye it's going to be a black car that'll come in to the picture here eventually because yas van der ven nope never mind because he's going to go straight off track and possibly massive issues for the 167 our tie our driver tied for the championship lead it all went wrong just he didn't break until the corner entry cisco he got far too late on the brakes and straight into the wall that's a not a mistake we usually see from Jos van der Ven in the 7 machine, and he is out. I'm wondering if that's possibly technical issues for the 167, because he did not turn the wheel a whole lot there, Jack. I'm wondering if he maybe possibly had an issue there where wasn't able to see where he was going. I'm not sure, but he falls off the racetrack. Also, David Riley spun around just as the leaders go past. But all, all of a sudden, Jas van der Ven, who was in a position where he needed to stay with our championship leader, Rosgen, is currently leading this race, not able to. So all of a sudden, this completely changes our championship standings because Jas van der Ven, he's going to need it all in race number two. He was turning right, Cisco. He was, he was almost trying to make the corner. Oh, did it just lock up on him? Yeah, it just locked up on him and it went. Well, I'll tell you what, he was probably trying then with all his might to get that car turned around. And uh, once you're, I guess, the case of uh, a force in motion tends to stay in motion for Jas van der Ven. Unfortunately, the physics not working out for him on that one. So Jas van der Ven going to fall all the way down to 24th on the, spo on the scoreboard. And probably more because that's going to be a big time tow and possibly required repairs on the number 167. So now to reshake everything else. Stefan Rosgen currently leads. We haven't talked about him in a while. Two and a half laps to go, by the way, the rest of your race. Rosgen continuing to lead. Karkner second. Uh, third right now being held by Bill Lawrence. And uh, Manning Grinnan now takes over that fourth position and is able to get by Joel Martin, who right now sits in your fifth position. Everybody else fairly spread out through the rest of your field. Everyone seems to also have just settled into a rhythm now, Calm down a bit. A bit of a hectic first few laps, but... Two and a half laps to go now. I think everyone's just got into it and found where they like to go, the lines that work best for them around this circuit, Cisco, and just get, get trying to get used to the car. I've seen somewhere that the driver was commenting that the setup was quite loose. That could be why we've seen quite a lot of drivers lose the rear ends here. So maybe people are just struggling to get their head around the setup. It could be a case in mid-Ohio is not a track where you want a loose setup, but Bill Lawrence now issues problems for the 17. And he's towed that car back to pit road. And survey says, I think that's coming through turn number nine, heading on to Thunder Valley. And that's exactly what it was lost. The, he tried to overcorrect the car and put it nose first into the wall. And now Bill Lawrence tows it behind the wall. So he's done. And now that'll move Grinnin up to third, but another shakeup in your top 10. Bill Lawrence, is, is he, it's, Hot luck, really, isn't it? That I talk about having a loose setup and someone loses the rear end into a corner, Cisco, isn't it? It's, it's just something that will happen on a race spot broadcast. And unlucky there for Bill Lawrence, obviously he's going to have another chance in race number two, and I'm sure we'll see him up at the front. But Manning Grinning is up on the podium after starting in fourth, so he hasn't made much of a move. Uh, biggest mover and shaker here today is going to be Mark Robertson and Paolo Bonacera. They are tied on moving up 11 places each. Uh, Mark Robertson currently in fifth, your reigning champion in the six Boss Racing Adventures, and Paolo Bonacera down in 16th. And I don't think we've said Mark Robertson once this broadcast, and I think that's because he's just been running his race, keeping the car on the track, and you make up 11 positions doing that, and that's how this race has gone. But I believe white flag going to be in the air this time for Stefan Rosgen, 
and uh, the driver of the 60 has done everything right this race, Jack, and just has to make one more circuit, and he's got this race victory. Yeah, just one more time around this Meadow Ohio sports car course, and all he's got to do is just keep it on the track. Three back markers ahead of him. That is the 645 and the 75 of, let me find out for you, Fred McIntosh, and come find the other driver. You might be able to see it before me, Cisco, but they probably will not be an issue because they are quite a way up the road. It's Ralph Kemmer in the 73, it looks like, in front of him, and a couple more cars up the road a little bit. A little bit of a battle between Carlos Campo Donico and John Unsby going at it for 22nd, 23rd. Unsby going to send it to the inside. A little bit of contact between those two. More contact between those two, and Donico going to get sent uh, off the racetrack a little bit there, so Campo Donico not going to be terribly happy about that. But for your leader, Stefan Rosgen, comes through turn number 11 and into turn number 12 just has one more turn left to go and for Stefan Rosgen picking up right where he left off winner in race number one here for the 60 plus racing adventures for round number six Stefan Rosgen brings home the checkered flag Stephen Cotton is just rounding the final turn now he's going to cross the line take second place and it looks as though Manning Grinnan, he's quite a way back, hasn't even reached the carousel yet, Cisco. He will take third. Joel Martin is too far back to challenge. Yeah, Martin not going to be able to catch him up. Has him in his sights, but just too far away to be able to do anything. Mark Roberts in a very quiet fifth. So an excellent job by the driver. The 43 passes 11 cars. And as cars continue to come across the line, I'm, I'm thinking here, Jack, this is race two is going to, we're going to see some drivers unhinged because we saw what Jas van der Ven had for speed-wise in race number one, and it all went wrong for him. You, We got to know he's going to be flying through this field trying to make up for it. I almost assure that in the paddock after this race, he is going to be fired up. He is going to be raring to go in race two, which should be starting in just over half an hour's time, and I'm excited to see how, how that plays out with Jas van der Ven. He will, of course, be up the front. Well, we'll run you through your full race results here from race number one of today's two race feature event. And it's Stefan Rosgen who brings home the victory, the checkered flag to the number 60. We'll see if we can get a word with him. We'll also catch a word with Stephen Karkner who finishes second, third gonna go to Manning Grinnan, fourth to Joe Martin, fifth place gonna go to Mark Robertson, sixth place gonna go to Joe Wren, finishing seventh gonna be Bob Kern, John Morgan finishes eighth, ninth gonna go to Remigio de Pasqua and John Hill rounds out your top 10. Mike Taylor just missing out on the top 10, finishing 11, feels behind him in 12. Fred McIntosh is going to be your final driver on the lead lap in 13th with Michael K in 14th. Kenneth Dummer is going to be 15th and Paolo Bonacera 16th. Richard Coolin, who we saw have a few issues at the start, is 17th and Michael Gol Golaski in 18th. Kenneth Baldwin in 19th and David Riley is going to round out your top 20. 21st going to go to Bill Lawrence. We'll be looking to see where he ends up in race number two. John Unsby finishes 22nd. Another driver lost 17 spots, so he'll be trying to work his way back to the front. Campo Donico, Jose Carlos Campo Donico, is going to finish 23rd up six spots, so a decent run for him. 24th, finishing right where he started, Charles Gilly, who did not have a good race. Gianni Rispaldo fell 12 spots. He's going to try and come back through your field in 25th. 26th, going to go to Ralph Kemmerer. 27th, Jas van der Ven, and we already talked about him. Look for him to fly through your field. Gerard Florissen, usually a top 10 car, finishes 28th. Another driver who's looking to have a better race, number two. Mark Lysen going to finish 29th, and Ralph out your field in the 30th position going to be Andrew Fiddler so a lot of cars in the back of your field and these guys will have to work on getting themselves back up in race number two but before we step aside we're going to catch a quick word with the driver of Stephen Karknew who finishes second Stephen it was crazy out there for us and for you I'm sure talk us through it Steve you got us you hear me now? Yep, now we got you. But uh, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a crazy race out there. We saw one incident in front of you during the race, but uh, a lot of drivers having trouble with the track. What was it like out there, man? Well, right from the first corner on, I got my rear tire pushed in by the uh, guy coming around and hitting me. That sort of slowed me down for the rest of the race, and then lap traffic was a little bit of a problem, and it was very slippery track today. Yeah, it was. You you had the contact with Grinnin there in uh, in turn number one before he even got to turn number one, but 
a lot of the race you were able to just kind of stay out of the wars and just let everything happen around you and was that kind of the strategy coming into today yeah try and get a small enough lead to uh get rid of the toe and, uh, stay out of trouble because this track is notorious for spinning out so you gotta stay away from all that and i'll tell you what you finished second that's gonna be an awesome point stay for you you got the second race though. Do you? I, I know you want to win this thing. Is that is that the game plan, or are you happy with this finish right now? Or what's the game plan for race number two? Game plan: out qualify Stefan, and then stay ahead of him for the rest of the race. I like it. But Stephen Karkner, you finished second here. Sponsor shout outs. Who gets it done for you in the seventy five team? I want to shout out to all my team members: Heart Racing, Hauling Ass Racing Team. Uh, thanks to all the. Sp to you guys for doing a great job on race spot tv and thanks to everybody who runs this league well that's steven karkner finishes second here from mid ohio sports car course we'll see you in race number two steve good luck thanks, and guys. uh yep thank you and as we get ready to step aside here we're gonna send you to commercial break and uh hugo's once again gonna back the trailer out of the parking lot only to drive it back into the parking lot so we get ready for race number two we'll send you to a couple words from our sponsors. But you're watching the 60 Plus Racing Adventures right here on Racebot TV and iRacing Live. Do us a favor, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Kyle Kimball, I am the manager of operations in the motorsports department for Mazda North American Operations. We are at uh, Bondurant Racing School here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and we are putting on the Mazda Road to 24 shootout. We started with 14 qualifiers that submitted business plans to us, and from those 14, we narrowed it down to four. Those qualifiers were Celine Roland, Tyler Casera, John Allen, and Preston Partis. the first session was just um, you know the memorization piece of the track um, I probably was halfway through the session before I felt like there were two or three places I could push now I knew what was next I already see some differences in preference of you know how people approach certain turns or certainly the breaking into the first chicane uh, is a little bumpy so um, there's a lot to learn but that's part of the fun As a judge, what we're looking for from these drivers is the opportunity that they take the information that we give them. They can then make themselves a better driver on the racetrack, and then we get to see that instantaneously the next session when we go out there. So we can see whether they can listen to us and comprehend what we're saying, put it into practice, and then see the result. I'm Jonathan Bomarito. Uh, I race the Mazda Factory uh, RT24P prototype for Mazda in the IMSA series. We've had four uh, really impressive guys here today, uh, all going for a $100,000 scholarship to run in the MX-5 Cup uh, Series next year. I'm Preston Partis. I'm from New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Actually, I've had iRacing since 2010, so I'm a five-star gold member on the uh, forums. Nothing like hopping on you know, with a few buddies and do a few sessions, but uh, it's great when you're learning a track. Uh, there's nothing like physically driving um, a racetrack. You can look at video, data, but nothing does justice to where you want to really place your car. And um, it really transfers really well. I think you need to do it nowadays. Hi, I'm Tyler Casera. Um, I'm an at-large nominee here at the shootout. Uh, Spec Miata racer and uh, won a couple championships in uh, SCCA and NASA. Um, you know, iRacing is, a, I think, a huge tool, a uh, great tool for me uh, to prepare for race weekends and uh, just hone my craft and stay sharp when I'm not actually at the track. 
Hey, my name is Salim Rayan, uh, ninth year Mazda racer. I currently race Spec Miata. Honestly, the first thing I thought of when I when I got in this car was how similar it is to iRacing. Took us one final session, but we do have a winner of the $100,000 value scholarship into the 2018 Mazda MX-5 Cup, and that winner is Selling Rolot. Congratulations. It's incredible knowing that now I'm a Mazda factory driver. I work for Mazda, classic Mazda in Orlando, Florida, and now I'm a Mazda factory driver. It's kind of my life now, even more than it was before. Just a professional race car driver. That's what everyone's, everyone's dream is, and, and my dream has become a reality. One driver of note, um, John Allen, um, came here today mainly with an iRacing background, and um, you know it, it was pretty impressive actually, I must say, how um, he started off in that he drove three sessions, every session solid improvement, lap times were coming down. Um, I, was, I was very impressed actually with his approach and a lot of that comes through the iRacing and uh, you really see how beneficial that is for these drivers trying to come up through the ladder. I've just started to watch my son get involved in iRacing and it wasn't available when I was around so I'm really captive now about how it can increase the ability for a driver to come to a racetrack and know the racetrack and really have a good feel of what to expect and we're seeing that with all the iRacing competitors that we've had come through the program so far. And this year with John Allen, and I've already said this to him, remarkably impressed with how well he has done. So through our partnership with iRacing, um, John Allen beat 17,000 other online racers to make it here today, which in and of itself is an incredible accomplishment. He showed today that he absolutely deserved to be with the three other drivers on track. Uh, he showed consistency and learning every single time he was on the track. He was in three sessions, and each session he got faster, sometimes by a half a second. The progression that he showed throughout the day was absolutely tremendous. I, I'm pleased with my performance. I, I'm pleased with the feedback I got, the opportunity to get the level of coaching that we did. Um, my goal right now is to make it back here next year, um, you know, through the through the real world competition uh, and just make it back as an at-large bid. I know a little more about the process. It leaves me better prepared to, uh, to come back and attack. No doubt, um, you know, the list is long of, of people to thank. Uh, my wife and, and our dog, and, and they were just fun road trips. We even snuck a family reunion in between two of the events this year. And, and uh, to that end, my family, you know, supporting me in this. Um, they don't need to understand it. They just know I love it. And that's, that's enough uh, for them to support me and, and push me further. Um, clearly, the practice I received over the last few years using iRacing is uh, very applicable. Um, to come out here and do a serviceable job, e even a highly competitive job, uh, is almost entirely due to that. Um, so I, I intend to still be a regular on there and, and continue honing my skills and uh, find some more tracks to translate that to next year. Hi guys, Scott Speed here, welcoming you to the Volkswagen Beetle GRC car here in iRacing. It is so fun. Wanted to give you guys uh, some pointers around the track here. This is the actual track uh, that we drove in Daytona. It looks unbelievable. When you see the footage from the onboard of the actual track, it's crazy how similar they got it. Give you some tips on the car. First thing you're gonna notice is this thing is a, a two liter turbo engine that has over 600 horsepower and it is geared for acceleration. So you're gonna go through the gearbox very quickly. That's the first thing you know. As soon as you leave the pits, you're gonna be like, wow. You're just gonna to have to upshift gears very rapidly. And then you're gonna get on the brakes for the first time and you're gonna notice this big momentum shift. The car is gonna lean over, it's gonna have a ton of weight transfer and that's because we run really soft springs in this thing to get the traction that you're gonna need in the dirt. Once you get through the first corner, 
you're probably going to realize that as soon as you touch the throttle, it doesn't really want to turn anymore. You've got to be aware that four-wheel drive likes to stop very quickly and it likes to go very quickly. It doesn't like the corner so much. To the first corner, you definitely want to wait until you're kind of straight to get on the gas. And that'll bring you up to the really fun section. And you get to experience dirt in a four-wheel drive rally car for the first time, and it's incredible. The thing you're going to notice is that the car wants to just continue going whatever direction it started in. So when you approach these corners, you're really going to have to turn quite before the corner, very early, and the car is going to develop this momentum to it. It's still very important to hit the apex and to be very tidy and clean, uh, but you're going to have to do that with the momentum of the car. And then you got this nice jump that is really fun. One thing to keep in mind when you're in the air is if you hit the brakes, the front end will come down. If you hit the, ga if you hit the gas, the front end will come up a little bit. So you've got to control, kind of like an airplane, the pitch of the car in the air so you're kind of flying straight. And as soon as you land here, you're going to want to start heading left. You're going to give it a big input and start it sliding to the left. And you're, you're just going to be constantly trying to slow this thing down to make this corner because it's very, very slippery and it's a very tight corner. And the preferred line, believe it or not, is still going to be right here at the apex. Once you get out of here, the next couple corners are relatively simple, typical tarmac corners, not a lot to these stuff. This is all flat out. And uh, yeah, let's see, what a, let's see what a full lap looks like. I got for Christmas this book written by Joe Soward called The World Atlas of Motor Racing. It's basically a coffee table book that's just got every circuit on planet Earth, along with history of each circuit, you know, organized by where they are, what countries, and so on. And it's just fabulous reading. But I remember um, reading about this circuit, the Nurburgring. I didn't really know much about even back then. Um, I think we were working on the original IndyCar racing. I mean, I knew a little bit about the Nurburgring because, of course, Mickey Lauda had crashed there. Jackie Stewart was legendary there. And, but this book made it sound like just an incredible place. For anybody who's in motor racing, it's like the ultimate challenge. It's basically still a throwback to the way circuits were back in the 20s, which is very long, super challenging extremely unsafe. But I remember that, I mean, for most of the circuits, they had track maps, kind of get a sense, oh, this is what this track looks like, and they'd have photos and whatever. The Nürburgring, there was no track map, because it was too long. They just talked about different sections of the track and the flute plots, you know, where the cars caught air and fox throat and, you know, all these famous spots. I just thought, geez, I gotta learn more about this track. And wouldn't that be a cool thing to be able to drive this in a sim? Of course, back then it was uh, we were still working on the original, you know, essentially the Indy 500 code base, and uh, the cars weren't 3D. Um, I mean, the f the physics for the cars was mainly a 2D model, and uh, the Nurburgring has tons of elevation change and you know all kinds of camber changes and banking and what have you and. Plus, it seemed incredibly daunting. I mean, it's one thing to build an oval or even a, a short road circuit, but, you know, a 14-mile track with mountains and villages and everything else to go through. It just seemed like, yeah, well, maybe someday. But it was kind of the inspiration for Grand Prix Legends. Because in that book there was not only the Nurburgring, but they talked about Monza, of course, and you know all these classic Grand Prix circuits from the 60s, and 
it really was a different era. You know, when they raced at Spa, Spa used to be out into the countryside between the farmhouses. There was like some high-speed sweeper, you know, going right through a village, you know, with basically hay bales protecting everybody. So I think three tracks really that are still around that are from kind of the 20s and before. Indianapolis is the oldest, um, built in 1911. Um, Monza and the Nürburgring, which was built between the wars, basically as a public works project to help put people to work after World War I. And really prior to the 20s, they used to just race on open roads in between towns. The Nürburgring was sort of still built when that was the way circuits were done. It was like a, this challenging, you know, take your car up and over a mountain and through the woods. And, but it's still very dangerous. I mean, it's, um, it's windy and narrow and it's hundreds of blind corners that you absolutely have to know, you know, where is the road going when I can see it again? It takes a while to learn. It's sort of like learning about five circuits. It's quite a challenge. I can remember at the time trying to figure out how do we even get a good map. We eventually got our hands on some survey data that the track had and were willing to share with us. So there were some drawings of certain sections of the track, not the whole thing because they didn't have it all. Aerial photos a little bit and, and then just a lot of video and photographs. And um, the geometry, I think, just itself was about six months, if I recall. And, you know, building all the objects and trees and everything took a pretty long time. But even back then, um, we weren't building nearly as many objects as actually exist around the track. I mean, it was sort of like, well, you know, this is a little village, so we'll put these buildings. We've got some pictures and we know there's this building and that building and this billboard. I mean, now each track is a significant piece of work. It's a whole team taking tens of thousands of photographs and laser scanning the entire track and, and then also talking with people who really know the track, the drivers who drive it all the time, you know, where are all the, the reference points that they use and make sure, you know, they're, they're always telling us, make sure to put this in, you gotta have this piece of tree, you gotta have this piece of paint. And then getting this right because this falls away in the exit, you can't see where your exit is. So you kind of have to get all of those reference points right to get to know where the exit is. You know, so now it's, it's a very different process. What you capture with the laser scanning is the expertise of the road builders. I mean, the guys who went and graded that circuit and built all the, you know, the road grades and banking and everything, they know how to build roads. And it's not a trivial exercise. When you're out there driving around, you realize, oh, everything is, is banked just right. There's nothing artificial about it. You know, in the old days, when we were making video game tracks ourselves, we don't have expertise in building roads or grading the entry to a corner or what have you. It really is pretty incredible to be making these sims in this industry that has changed so much just in 25 years. I mean, back when I first was thinking, oh, we should build the ring, there wasn't enough memory to do it, the, you, the, you couldn't render it, it wouldn't have been fast enough. I mean, the, the graphics, if we go back and look at those old games, and it's just like, it's laughable. I mean, how did anybody even think that this was fun? <laughs> but to be able to just continually, uh, you know, raise the bar the way that we can in this industry, and, um, you know, now, you go out there on the ring and it's as though you are there. Especially if you have a three screen setup, I mean, you'd be at the ring. It looks like the ring, it will almost feel like the ring. I remember once having a dream when I was doing Indy 500. I had a dream about a flight simulator where the graphics was just incredible. It was all, it looked like real graphics and I, I just thought, oh geez, you know, we're way behind. It's like. Uh, how are we gonna how are we gonna do that kind of graphics? And then I woke up and I was like Whew. <laughs> I don't have to do that But the funny thing is now the graphics that we see today are far better I'm sure than what I sort of envisioned as being oh that would be the most amazing thing that you could do um, I mean now it's like real life you look at it. And I mean really if you don't look really closely 
you can't tell. It's really cool. And I mean, we keep being able to do more and more and more stuff. So hopefully it'll just get that much better. We're back here on Race Spot TV and iRacing Live as race number two of the 60 plus racing adventures gets underway from the mid-Ohio sports car course. Disco Scaramuza alongside Jack Styles to bring you all the action. Hugo Louise down the production trailer, got it back down, drove it back in the parking lot, and we're ready to kick things off here for second race of two on the afternoon. And Jack, the first race, well, it was a lot of things. And uh, one thing it wasn't was calm but I don't expect much to change coming into race number two because now we have guys like Jas van der Ven and a couple other drivers like, you know, a John Unsby or a Gerard Florison who are going to be driving through the entire field, depending on where they qualify, of course, to get back and try and get a better points finish versus race number one. A lot of desperation on the line now. I mean, race one was chaotic i think is the best word to describe it cisco and i don't think race two is going to be much different only two drivers at the moment in the one minute 16s and qualifying stefan rosian your race one winner is on pole with a one minute 16.764 as it stands jos van der ven is behind you on the one minute seven seven two eight these two were the two who we saw one and two in the last race cisco looks this way it's gonna, looks like it's going to be that way this race yeah and a couple cars on track and I think what we'll do right now is let's hop on board the 014 of David Riley so we can get a little bit more of a perspective of what's so challenging about this mid-Ohio sports car course. One of the most challenging road courses in the United States and uh, one of, I believe, the most challenging race track that these guys are probably going to be running all season long just looking at the schedule. I mean, they go to Mount Panorama, though, so I mean, that kind of over overtakes this, but this is definitely up there. But you see David Riley is driving through this area just past China Beach into kind of what is known as the S's on this course. And this is where we start to see the problems here, Jack, because the altitude change here is insane compared to a lot of other circuits. It is, and a lot of the circuits, you're pro the only other circuit that I can really think on the schedule that really is big on the altitude change is going to be Mount Panorama. You're going up the mountain, down the mountain, up the mountain, down the mountain. They're going to do that for an evening worth of racing. Unfortunately, we won't be covering Mount Panorama. They've chosen to see Snetterson instead. But, I mean, obviously, as we just see, David Riley actually make a small mistake just avoiding the wall there in that number 014 machine. But Mid-Ohio is definitely a challenging circuit. I think we've just proven that on the broadcast, Cisco. Yeah, and that carousel's odd because it's very it's very reminiscent of the Road America carousel in terms of it's almost it almost goes a 180, but not quite. It's more like 165 to 170. And uh, you also have that left hand turn, which is completely on camber and just all out of nowhere. So turn number 13, very challenging. And we've seen drivers in the past in real life lose it off that turn. So you see Riley now on the on the start finish straight at least for IMSA this is the initial start where they start the race but kind of coming down here and we saw Jas van der Ven fall off here and this is turn number four and turns number five past that China Beach area once again and a lot of altitude on this as well he come down the hill straight into this right hander and basically anytime you see a gravel strip off to the side of your racetrack here Jack that means cars are probably going to go off there cars are likely to go off into a gravel track yes Cisco and 
It will be interesting to see how many we have. We had, I reckon we had at least a third of the field on a gravel track at one point in race one. I'm maybe going to expect to see a few less in this race because then we're not going to be having, obviously, I think everyone would have found a rhythm now and we won't be seeing the carnage again, but couple, the last couple of drivers just now going to be completing their final qualifying laps before we head down to the grid for the second race. Yeah, and you see David Riley uh, pulling that car over. Everybody at this point has taken their time and just sitting on pit road waiting for the qualifying session to end. So I guess while we're sitting here, um, we'll take a look kind of coming up at what is to come here for this series that we won't be able to see. We'll be able to see Stetterton, which will be the season finale. But coming up next week for this series, they're going to be heading to Imola, the Grand Prix circuit there. And then they're doing a 45-minute endurance race at Watkins Glen Classic Boot, which I love because it gets rid of the boot, which is, you know, the bus stop at Watkins Glen, but you still run the boot. So there's still some challenge to that circuit. That's going to be fun. And you got Summit Point, as we mentioned, Mount Panorama. And then they go to Le Mans, which that's not the Bugatti circuit, Jack. That's Le Mans, Le Mans. We don't have the Bugatti circuit in iRacing. I believe when iRacing scanned it, it was full of camper vans and cars so all we have is the 24-hour circuit and for these cars that's gonna, you're gonna be spending a long time on the limiter cisco and it's I, it looks to me like based on what they have listed it's going to be the tw the regular 24 hours not the not the uh, legacy version so they aren't running the straightaway because then they would be basically just be on the chip i don't even know if the motors would last that entire straightaway it, because it they just blow up <laughs> You get about halfway down the Mulsanne and you, you you just go, oh, there's no power left in the car. Oh, hang on, yeah. I've just lost an engine. We're on lap two. So that, that'll that be fun for those guys. And, of course, we rejoin them back for week number 12. That'll be February 28th, which I believe is just after the Daytona 500. That'll be at Snetterton. The, the 200 circuit will be taken to that, and I'm sure Jack will fill us in with all sorts of history lessons as that is his home track. It is. I live 20 minutes away from the circuit, and I was first there when I was three months old, so nearly 17 years ago. So you're a fan? A little bit of a fan? Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit of a fan. I, I love the circuit. Um, I have a few opinions on the recent upgrades by Motorsport Vision, but I just think it's got a lot of character in the place. And, well, we didn't go to Interlagos, so Hugo can't talk about that, and we didn't go to Indianapolis, so I can't talk about that. But, oh, well... We'll, uh, we'll take a look at your starting grid now because qualifying is actually beginning to wrap up here. So we'll get off the random, uh, random topic area and we'll hand you down to your, L to your race spot TV starting grid, not your LSR TV starting grid. Stefan Rosegen gets the pole this time. Once again, two for two on the day. Jas Vanderven, two for two on starting second. And from what it sounds like, actually had a little bit of a throttle problem in race number one, which might explain some of the issues that he ran into in that first race. John Morgan going to start third. Manning Grinning going to start fourth. And John Unsby running out your top five with Steven Karkner starting sixth. Bob Curran starting seventh. Eighth going to go to Mark Robertson. Ninth going to go to Bill Lawrence. And Remigio de Pasqua going to round out your top ten. 11th is going to go to Joel Martin alongside him on row number six is going to be Mike Taylor. Jared Forreston, who he had some, or we saw some issues with in the first race, is going to be 13th. Kenneth Baldwin is going to be 14th. Joe Wren, 15th. And Jay Frill, 16th. Gianni Rispaldo going to be 17th. Fred McIntosh, hoping to have a bit of a, a bit more luck in race two, is going to be 18th. Richard Coulomb is going to be 19th. And Charles Jeff Gilly is going to be lining up 20th. Not a great grid position for John Hill, going to be starting 21st. Ralph Gemmer is going to start 22nd, 23rd. Bruce Gould, Kenneth Doomer going to start 24th, 25th going to go to Michael Key. Dave Riley going to start 26th. Jose Carlos Campodonico is going to start 27th, 28th going to go to Michael Goralski. Mark Lysen rounds out your 29 car fields. Only one car down from what we had previously. 20 laps, 30 minutes these guys have. It's going to be the 20 laps because, of course, we don't have full course cautions. Don't have to worry about the race getting slowed down. But most of your field behind the iRacing Rough RT 12-hour pace car getting ready to take the green flag. And just a short kind of jump here from the where we're sitting just kind of in Thunder Valley, just getting up to turn number 10. So only a couple more turns, and we'll keep an eye on turns number 12 and 13 because we had a little bit of an issue between Grinnon and Karkner going through there during the last start. Let's see how 
they make it through there as well. So we get set to head through the carousel. The American Ethanol green flag getting ready to get thrown in the air. We thank you for joining us here on race number two for Race Bot TV. Green flag in the air. Let's do it again. Everybody looks good through turn number one right now. Not as many issues and a little bit of side-by-side -side action in your field right now. And it's a big kind of group all behind John Morgan as they head into the keyhole for the first time. Lots of cars together. Everybody going to be able to hold on to it, Jack, as they head out of the keyhole down onto the long straightaway here as they head for turn number four. Looks as though we just almost had contact between Mark Robertson and Bob Kern, the two teammates there coming through the keyhole. Everyone else, though, seems to be nice and cleanly away. No incidents like we saw on the first on the first race. Everyone's just settled down. The 73 of Ralph Kemmerer, though, is a long way back since going to happen there. Yeah, not sure what happened to Kemmerer, but either way... We'll spin at turn one. Oh, yeah. No, it was a spin out of turn one. We uh, missed that one, so there was one issue, and we'll take a second look at that here coming up and it was looks like just not a good entry to that and yep we are taking a second look at it and i honestly don't know where he was going because you that he got a bit of the pit axis run a little bit of the bump there so either way camera not going where i think he wanted to go in the 73 spins out turn number one lap number one and kind of in the same position where he's nearly half a lap behind at this point so camera got a long way to go if he hopes to get back up into this group, but breakaway for your top two, Rose Jen and Va Jans van der Ven have left the rest of the field behind because John Morgan, well, is a little bit more accordion behind him last lap. is a little bit of a battle. Oh, oh contact. Cut, cut, and it looks like he's spun the man in green. That was synchronized spinning there. Cisco, what do you think we're going to have in the 60 plus racing event? Just look like there's just a little bit of front to rear contact between those two. And it just, again, too much speed, not enough, not enough grip into the keyhole for those two. And that is unfortunate. Steven Kartner has rear wing damage. Manning Grinning may have front wing damage. And it acted almost like a shelf, like you would see in dirt racing, where those guys were so far off to the outside of the corner that the kind of the, the, the end of the track almost falls off. And the contact didn't help any for sure. But both of those guys off off the top of that shelf and they just kind of slide off the rest of the track. So it kind of almost cleaned the track off a little bit. But either way, after that incident, everybody else actually fairly spaced out. The closest battle I'm looking at right now is that battle for third is John Morgan and John Unsby. Those two fairly close together. Unsby got a little bit loose though. Starts to fall back off the rear end of the 177. Unsby, yeah, just, it just looks as though the rear was getting away from this loose setup. The drivers clearly aren't enjoying around here. And he's just careful on the throttle through turn one. You can hear the engine notes rise as they head down towards turn two. And it just looks as though he won't be close enough to challenge down the speed trap into China Beach for the third time. Everyone else at the moment just looking like they're nice and close. We have got long trains of cars here, Cisco. Everyone is nice and close together. The 006, Joe Wren is round at turn one. What has happened here? Just looks again as though he ran wide at turn one, Cisco. Another turn one is taking its victims. It's like turn five for Red Atlanta. Yeah, it's just too much speed. Ren carried through the corner and he paid for it, so didn't necessarily get loose, but just too much speed in the corner and falls off track. So big problems for the 006 and possible issues, it looks like, for the 44. I, the timing went a little crazy for me there for a moment, so we'll take a second look. It was actually a massive issue with Ren picking him up after that. And Donico for Campo Donico for whatever reason just massive contact with Joe Wren. That's a huge incident. That is a huge incident. Not really sure what caused that one, but Joe Wren has been back into the pits and so has Carlos or Jose Carlos Campo Donico. And I think that is their their events over. Looks like we've got another car stop. It is the number three machine of Kenneth Baldwin. What's happened there? Looks like he's been in the barrier, Cisco. He has indeed, and it's just too much speed through the chute and into the wall before the carousel. Yeah, it's turn number 11, and just car got loose and wasn't able to save it. So Campo Donico running into issues, Kenneth Baldwin running into issues, and Joe Wren, your three cars currently who have had most of the issues so far. Of course, Ralph Kemmerer at the beginning of the race, but he's been able to hold on to it as David Riley re-entering the circuit once again. And he's going to try and make up a couple positions if he can. Meanwhile, that battle for third is fairly spread out at this point. is one car going off track. It looks like Kenneth Baldwin again 
but everybody else fairly spread out as it looks like John Morgan has taken that third position and John Unsby has fallen back to six and all that excitement. We missed what happened in 61, but he's now behind Bill Lawrence and uh, Lawrence right now sitting in the fifth position. Bill Lawrence, is, yeah, Bill Lawrence has gone up that position. He's actually fifth, yeah, John, it looks like John Unsby actually, he ran wide at what, turn one. He um, just too much speed into turn one and couldn't get through the corner, Cisco. He's out wide and gave Bill Lawrence the position. Looks like also Mark Robertson found his way through as well. Though for those of you playing at home, turn number one has claimed most of the cars today so far with turn number two right up there as well. And uh, that means for Unsby, he was sitting in a very good position. Going to have to make up that time if he hopes to get back to where he started. He's started fifth, so he gained a couple spots, but has fallen back to sixth, so he needs to get past Bill Lawrence if he hopes to make those positions up. But apart from that, everybody else kind of in train in a little bit of a pack racing is meanwhile side by side. Ger Gerard Florissant and Manning Grinnan gonna go side by side. That's plus one for the driver of the 47. And Grinnan, once again, kind of in the same position he was in race number one, has to work his way back through the pack. Not due to the same issues from race number one, but just didn't have a uh, particularly good start to the race. He's down six positions here. Yeah, he looks as though he's made his way back past uh, Gerard Florissant in the number seven machine. Now put a little bit of a gap between him, even though Gerard was trying to challenge down into China Beach. It, but yeah, it just looks as though Manning Grinning, this hasn't been his day. And we know he's fast, but he's just not obviously got the car under him. And he just doesn't feel confident with the setup. And Jared Ferguson is now going to be under attack from John Martin from behind in the number 27 machine. This is your battle for P number 11. Another car spinning off track quickly. It's the 610 as he was heading through turns number 5 and 6. So the 610 loses the car through that one. But yeah, I'm watching that battle for fourth right now. Very close together are those guys and Lawrence closing in. He should, I think, get the draft once they leave the keyhole here, Jack, and might be able to make the pass, and he's going to have to play defense with Unsby, though. I think Unsby's probably going to be able to make the move before Lawrence will. I think Lawrence is a little too far back. Lawrence is a little bit too far back in the draft. He's, he's got the draft, but he's just not close enough to make it work. John Unsby, though, on the other hand, he is. Is Bill Lawrence going to defend the inside? Is Bill Lawrence going to defend the outside? He's going to go inside. He's going to force John Unsby to go the long way around, but he's going to have the inside line. But Unsby just loses the rear end. Lucky to save that there, Cisco. And he's Bob Kern all of a sudden is back into this. And Ramigo de Pasqua as well has just sat there waiting in the clutches. We've got about a five-car train here, Cisco, for the battle for P number five. And I, I mentioned at the top of the broadcast, after we had gone through kind of the beginning chaos of race number one, it felt like a race at the Nürburgring. This feels very Nürburgring right now because you have Bill Lawrence, John Unsby, Bob Kern, Remigio DePasco, and Mike Taylor all very close to each other, but not really able to do anything. As it looks like Manning Grinnan, the 47 car, running into more issues. He spun off track in Thunder Valley past turn number nine, and a bad day goes from goes even worse for Manning Grinnan. He's fallen back now to 21st. And what happened with the number 47? It was issues going through turn number nine. And uh, actually, no, it was past turn number nine. It was actually the altitude, I think, that got the car loose. Tried to overcorrect and just spun it out, Jack. Rear end must have got loose on that car, and it just snap oversteered on him. And once it snap oversteers in one of these cars, you've got no chance of saving it. You are a passenger at that point, and the wall is incoming fast. So you have to hit the brakes. But this train for P number five is spread out a little bit, Cisco. But actually, I'd almost say that Mark, it's going to actually soon be a seven car train for P number three, because Bill Lawrence is very quickly catching up to the back of Mark Robinson, who isn't far back from John Morgan in third. And getting back to the point that I was trying to make before uh, we lost Grinnan coming out of turn number nine, it feels like a Nürburgring race because everyone's fairly close together, but nobody's really battling. It's more a case of who makes that mistake. And it's like we see at the Nürburgring all the time, these long trains of cars that are close to each other, but can't really make a move because it's so hard to pass on the corners here at Mid-Ohio. You need, you really need somebody to make a mistake if you hope to get past them. It's very similar to what we see at the Nürburgring all the time. It's a race of attrition here, says guy, I think, and it's, it's the same at the Nürburgring. It's who can survive the race. And I mean, obviously, we're having a half an hour race here at Mid-Ohio. We don't usually see anything over about an hour at Mid-Ohio, but you go to uh, the Nürburgring, you can have four, six, and we have a 24 hour race every year at the Nürburgring. So just, it's definitely a race of attrition in that place. And it's same with here. Unfortunately, obviously this hasn't got the same complexity as the Nürburgring. It's not as long. 
and it's about was a lot shorter than the Nurburgring, but it's still got the same challenge. It's still got the, the undulations, the off-camera corners, and the altitude change. And problems for the 21 at the last corner, Duralski, and uh, he spun it off turn number 12, and uh, that car just one of those lazy spins. He didn't even make it quite through the corner, so Duralski going to fall off track and kind of fall back through your field as he's able to get back by Kemmerer, but another car falling off track, and... Uh, Kind of a long day for a lot of these guys, but getting, I think if we talk any more about the Nürburgring, James May is going to come hunt us down and hit us with a cricket bat. So I think we're going to step away from that and talk a little bit about that battle for third because Mark Robertson was able to open up that gap he had on Bill Lawrence that was closing. It's starting to go where he's able to stop worrying about defending from Lawrence and start working on attacking John Morgan right now. John Morgan is, we know he's a fast driver, looks like they've got a little bit of traffic ahead in the form of Jose Cam Carlos Campo de Nico in the number 44 machine. But Mark Robertson, we know he's fast, he's the reigning champion, Cisco, and so is John Morgan. He is, a, he is a race winner in this series. They both are, in fact, and these guys can, I would expect, a nice clean fight from them. But if you look behind, we've got Bob Kern and John Unsby as well. They, they look like they're close and in a bit of a battle. Though Lawrence at the moment is just in the middle, not doing much. Yeah, I think Lawrence is going to need these guys to go side by side in front of him if he's going to catch them back up. But I will say going through the corners, Lawrence looks a little bit more planted than Robertson. But I think Robertson has a better car on the straightaways and kind of the long sweepers versus the S's. So these guys working their way through and Lawrence is just gonna have to sit there and uh, see if he can catch them up on uh, speed or if he's gonna need them to go side by side. Bob Kern and John Unsby starting to close up a little bit. And Kern has the opportunity to grab six spot away and put John Unsby two positions down from where he was. And we have a new fastest lap, this goes uh, Stefan Rosgen. He is untouchable today. So is Jos van der Ven. Those two, well, the gap between first and third at the moment is 10 seconds and He's just set a new fastest lap of one minute 16.547. Only other driver in the one minute 16 is Jost van der Ven. So these two are obviously fast, but no one can touch them. And Stefan is just off into the distance. And, and for, for van der Ven, it's, it's a better run than he had in race number one. But remember, it was himself that brought around the issues in race number one. A lot of those issues coming, I believe he had a throttle problem in race number one. That caused a lot of the issues on that 167. So van der Ven... By no means out of it just yet, or I will say safe just yet. He still has 10 more laps to go. His car off track, and that looks to be, it's Ralph Kemmerer, the 73 more issues, and that's Mark Lyson, who he's going to go past as well. So two cars spun out or just around turns number nine in the Thunder Valley complex here in mid-Ohio. And once again, kind of the same names popping up and just the case, Jack, where I think if you're not comfortable at mid-Ohio, you're just, you're not going to be comfortable anytime soon. No, and I think I have a theory about something. I think Mark Robinson's making made a mistake because all of a sudden Bill Lawrence is on his tail. John Morgan's pulled away for third. He's now got a gap of around three seconds, two seconds. Mark Robinson, is, I think, has made a mistake somewhere, Cisco. Yeah, and that'll uh, that'll allow to bring Lawrence into this fight and. I thought John Unsby might be a factor in this, but he's kind of more battling alongside Bob Kern at the moment, so I'm not sure he's going to have anything for Lawrence. But, yeah, I think Bill's just been running the traditional Bill Lawrence, you know, just sit and just ride and be consistent race, and that's what he's doing right now, and it's worked because Mark Robertson, you make a mistake and you fall right into the clutches of the 17, so these two can be fairly close together as we head once again through China Beach and up towards the S's. And the S's, obviously, one thing I am going to say about the S's is you come on over the top. Turn five is a very tough corner because you're coming over the top. The car will be getting light as you're turning left. And you want to be getting on the power as soon as possible before hitting the brakes for six in the S's. And being able to do that in one of these cars is a lot easier. Than, it's probably a lot harder than it looks and because, obviously, you've got the weight transfer of the car. Not much in a Formula car, uh, a bit more on a GT car because there's more weight to it. But it's still that transfer of weight, Cisco, that a lot of these drivers will be finding hard. I'm actually surprised we haven't had more incidents at turn five most of the incidents have been at turn one yeah turn five is the tricky one but i think some of the downforce on these pro mazda is helping them out if we were racing something more akin to like an xfinity car or maybe a Kia or something like that something with a little less downforce and a little more weight to it i think five would be catching out more cars but 
I think with the wing configuration on these cars, I think five isn't necessarily the problem because we're seeing a lot of these fast corners catching a lot of drivers out. Turn one, the entry to turn number two, and turn four and turn nine, all very fast entry corners. That's where we've seen a lot of the issues. So I think that high speed downforce is where these guys are having a lot of the issues, Jack. You know what I want to see these guys do? I want, to, I want them to swap the Pro Master, a car which is very much based on downforce, and use the Porsche 911 car, car, a car which is based on mechanical grip, and just see how the race changes. It'd be an inverse race almost, nearly. It would. The incidents. It would, and I think it would make it more interesting. I mean, I've, I've got quite a bit of experience in that car. I ran the DGFX series in it, and to drive it was a lot of fun because you could get the rear end out, you could catch it, you could... It was like sliding through every corner as we just see. Oh, is that Mark Lyson or is that Kenneth? No, sorry. That was uh, Kemmer. They just went past the uh, slow car there, the 73. And yeah, we've been keeping an eye on this battle between Lawrence and Robertson because it's slowly been closing. Lawrence playing the Jaws theme out the car stereo if he could and uh, closing up. I think, I don't know if he's going to be able to get him necessarily coming out of the keyhole, but he's going to have the opportunity to make something happen here. You see he closes up that accordion effect happening once again. So it looks like possible issues with the 91 of Jay Friels falling down the order a little bit. Now he just lost two positions to Remigio de Pasqua and Manning Grinnan. So looks like Friels losing a couple spots as Fred McIntosh falls off on turn number one. So another fast speed corner bites the 645 and uh, McIntosh loses about two positions for him and meanwhile Lawrence he's right there looking to make that move for fourth. Lawrence is definitely on the tail of the car ahead of Mark, of Mark Robinson and he wants that position I think he wants all the points he can get I can't remember where he finished in race one Cisco you might be able to quickly find it for me but um, he obviously wants to try and get ahead of Mark Robinson if you can try and steal some championship points off Mark that would be great and Obviously, Mark and Bill is a rapidly fast driver, former race winner as well, I believe, Cisco in this series. Yeah, and Lawrence did not, he was one of the drivers who did not have a good race number one, looking just at the, uh, at the race results from that finish 21st. So Lawrence definitely looking, I believe it was actually, I believe it was the issue out of turn number nine, if I remember correctly, where the car got overcorrected and he nosed into the wall. So Lawrence in a much better position on points as is Jas van der Ben. So this is a huge opportunity for Lawrence to overcome the issues he had in race number one and make up some of those badly needed points. Also another driver doing that, Gerard Florissen sitting in 10th position. And how about Bruce Poole sitting 11th plus 12? Absolutely monster run. Is Bill Lawrence gonna make a monster run to the inside in turn number four? It looks as though he has. Bill Lawrence has moved away up into fourth position. Mark Robinson has been dropped out to fifth. I think Mark just chose the wrong line to defend there and had no way of stopping Bill coming through on the inside. He had that done and dusted before you even climbed the hill for turn number six, Cisco. Yeah, and now through turn number nine down into Thunder Valley once again and throw John Unsby and Bob Kern into this fight because they're very much a part of it now. And for Mark Robertson, it's you got to stop the bleeding at this point because uh, otherwise he might get freight trained if he's not careful because those two have been very close together for most of this race. Six laps to go at the line. Six laps to go at the line indeed and it's going to be a long six laps for some of these drivers especially for... What's actually? Cisco, Jos van der Ven, he's dropped back to third. What's happened here? Oh no, not, no it could be possibly more issues. Self-inflicted issues. Yeah, it was he a spun spin. coming out of Thunder Valley by the looks of it, and that is a big changer. I mean, I think he'll get back past John Morgan, but he has just dropped a long way back, and he was lucky to keep that out of the wall. In fact, a little bit of power that just got him facing the other direction, spun it round, and off he went again. But he has lost one position in the pro process, and he is now in a fight with John Morgan around the second back, Cisco. Yeah, and he should be able to get past Morgan just looking at the lap times. Uh, but, well, he still has to make the pass happen. So we head through, down down through the S's into turn number nine once again, back into the Thunder Valley complex under the bridge. And for, for Van Der Ven, yeah, you can see he's already visually closing the gap on John Morgan. So Morgan not going to be there for very long. Meanwhile, that battle between Unsby, Robertson, and Bob Kern has kind of spread itself out a little bit. Those guys going to run a little bit of a train of cars through fourth 
through seventh or so. And we'll go back because there's another train of cars starting to form and car blowing up. Oh no, it wasn't, that was the wall. But David Riley slow going through turns number one and that's gonna cause Morgan to spin. It threw him off going into turn number one. I wouldn't say that that was anything to do with it. He got on the curb, Cisco, and it just unsettled, looks like he unsettled the, the tires and the suspension and around he went. Jos van der Ven has now obviously inherited second again, but John Morgan, he's down to seventh. That makes Bill Lawrence in third. So Bill Lawrence's tactics of just sitting back, relaxing and driving the race as it is, not getting into any trouble, has worked. And uh, it looks like maybe John Morgan got a little bit distracted maybe or something like that, or that's what it looked like to me because he clipped the apex that normally he'd been fine on. So that's what I'm wondering, even even though Riley didn't really do much to Morgan's run, maybe just a little bit of a distraction because otherwise Morgan makes it through that corner. So the 177, for whatever reason, turn number one does not go well, clips that bump on the apex and all of a sudden he finds himself facing backwards and now finds himself sitting four spots back from where he started. Not good for the 177. And off the podium, Cisco. Don't forget that he's yes. also going to be—he's also going to be looking ahead of him, and thinking these guys are fighting for the position that I was just in. I want some of this, so I think you'll find he will be having his foot down for the rest of this race, trying to make up some time. But he is now, at least, he's—it looks as though he's about four seconds back at the moment, and I don't really see him making that up in four laps and being able to pass them. Bob Kern has dropped back off the end of this, off the end of this pack. John Unsby looks like he went mega deep into the keyhole then almost going into the side of Mark Robertson but just getting on the brakes just hard enough to avoid him so we've got a three car th train for third now and at the moment it runs Bill Lawrence, Mark Robertson, John Unsby and also the one thing I am picking up here Cisco is the draft isn't that big of an effect most of the circuits we have been to we've seen some amazing draft racing four wide ones at Watkins Glen I seem to remember but here it hasn't really happened that much not really i think the first the first two straightaways are probably going to be more akin to that since you're in a higher gear but because the speed out of the keyhole is so low i think it's taking away some of that slipstream effect that these guys have and it's you know we say that that back straightaway that's because it's kind of what it is it's really not that long you know this is only a two uh, two and a quarter mile circuit it's really not that long. I mean, these guys are only clicking off about minute 16 lap times versus something like a Spa or something like even a Watkins Glen, very similar to that. So not a high speed straightaway. And because it's, you know, relatively short, all considering when you're starting from such a low gear, it's hard to be able to build that slipstream, really. The slipstream is one of the big important things in this car. And if you just cannot get hold of it and it does, you can't make it work. You you're not going to go very far, I don't think, and that is an unfortunate thing, I think, but some some circuits it works really well, some circuits it doesn't. When we go to Snetterson, actually, I, I do think that the draft will be a massive thing, and it will be used a lot by drivers. There are two extremely long straights that we're going to be using. One, they're both off of hairpins, but they do have, they are reasonable length, so we should see some good racing out of there. Yeah, absolutely, and... How about let's talk about a guy we haven't talked about all day, and that's because he's been leading and just doing his thing has been Stefan Rosgen, who's almost like he's not even in this race. That's how far ahead he is. 15 seconds. That's, that's nearly a fifth of the lap time on these guys that he's ahead, and it shows because there's nobody around him. Jas van der Ven's coming through turn number 13. Rosgen, meanwhile, is coming up to the keyhole now, so that whole first area, Rosgen's just gone. Roshan's almost a, almost got a sector on Joss van der Ven. He's got 15 seconds lead. That is just wow. I I don't even I can't even com comprehend how you can do that in such a short race, Cisco. He has been on fire today, and he has been constantly running in the 116s. And that is just he's just cut fast and consistent. All you need to be as a driver. Well, I'll tell you what. If Michael Lutz listening and uh, the captains from Team the Edge or Club Deanch, they better call him up next time because he is uh, he is flying out there. So keep an eye on that 60 car either way, but one lap to go at the line, white flag, and we're gonna watch the battle. Ooh, we got a little bit sketchy there, and that was Mark Robertson and John Unsby trying to get around the lap machine of Michael Goralski, and they were heading through turns number four and five, and it got very sketchy there for a moment. Both cars able to hold onto it, but closed up, and uh, not a lot of racing room to go three wide here. 
no, there's almost no racing room to go three wide here, Cisco. You, you don't want to be doing it, especially through that section of the circuit. It's just, it almost looks like John Unsby has actually lost some gap to the car ahead, but as as we come on to the final lap, Stephen Rosgen has taken the white flag and he is now starting his final run down towards the speed trap in China Beach. La last battle, we'll take a look at those. Richard Coulomb, Remigio de Pasqua, and John Hill because there's three cars all in a hornet's nest. Manning Grinnan was at the head of that pack, lost all three spots, so a lot of angry cars around there. We'll turn to those guys once we get through your start finish line because Stefan Rosgen working his way through China Beach right now and for him it's been a very very slick ride and fairly easy for the driver of the 60 he's been fast all day he's going to bring home his second checkered flag not really going to be a points advantage as Grinnan able to get past John Hill but as they head through Thunder Valley looks like Rosgen headed for another victory good drive by Rosgen all in both races today it's just been awesome to see someone out there dominating Absolutely, he heads through the carousel. And just one more turn left to go. And for Stefan Rosgen, it's two for two. He's batting a thousand here at Mid-Ohio. Stefan Rosgen wins race number two of round number six of the 60 plus racing adventures. We'll run through the rest of the battles going on right now. How about the battle between the 43? They're gonna come up to the carousel now. Does Unsby have anything for Robertson? Doesn't look like, and Lawrence gonna run away from those guys. Lawrence will finish third. Yas van der Ven, by the way, finishes second. Mark Robertson finishes fourth. Hunsby fifth, Bob Kern sixth. Now we shift to the battle between the seven and the 57. Gerard Fleuris and trying to hold off Bruce Poole in the final closing corners. Just looks as though Bruce Poole won't have enough to get it done coming through the final section and Gerard Thurston looks like he is going to be taking that position number 10. He's made it, he's actually gone up from where he started Cisco because he started 13th, but Bruce Paul, I think big round of applause to him. He should be giving himself a pat on the back after this race. He is up 12 positions on where he started. Started 23rd and finished 11th. Yeah, biggest mover all day. Also that battle for 10th. John Fleuris and going to hold on to that. Bruce Paul, like you said, finishes 11th, 12th. Respaldo, Coulomb, DePasqua, and Hill, and Grinnan, they're all going to make it through. And before we finish the final running order, we'll recap and go through your full finishing order. Make sure we get everybody's name up here. So, full race results here from Mid Ohio for the second race on the day. Stefan Rosgen gets the victory. Yas van der Ven finishes second. Bill Lawrence third. Mark Robertson fourth. Fifth going to go to John Unsby. Sixth to Bob Kern. Seventh place going to go to John Morgan. Mike Taylor finishes P number eight. Ninth going to go to Joel Martin and Gerard Fleuris and going to round out your top 10. Your biggest mover and shaker today, Bruce Paul, is going to be finishing in 11th with Gianni Raspaldo behind him in 12th. 13th is going to go to Richard Coolen with 14th going to Romigo de Pasqua in the four machine with John Hill rounding out your top 15. 16th is going to go to Manning Grinnan. Bad day for him. He is down 12 positions on where he started. 17th is going to go to Kenneth Dummer. 18th to Jay Frills. 19th to Charles Jelly. And 20th to Michael Gorlaski. Michael Key is going to finish 21st. 22nd going to go to Stephen Karkner. So not the race he wanted at all, but luckily had that first race to fall back on. So Karkner will be okay in the point standings. Ralph Kemmer going to finish 23rd. 24th going to go to Mark Lyzen. 25th to David Riley. Fred McIntosh finishes 26th. Jose Carlos Campodonico going to finish 27th. 28th going to go to Kenneth Baldwin. And Joe Wren rounds out your 29 car field here as we head to victory lane to talk with the driver who batted a thousand here from the mid-Ohio sports car of course Stefan Rosgen made it look easy all day long and bets a thousand wins both races here for the 60 plus racing adventures and Stefan it was a dominating performance my friend talk us through it yes it looked so but uh, it was uh stuff for me at the beginning i was uh, quite nervous but uh, it went easy as soon as uh, you got i'll tell you what once you got out to kind of your lead you were able it made the race a whole lot easy for, easier for you because you didn't have to worry about traffic a whole lot and you didn't have to worry about guys catching you from behind what was your secret really to having such a consistent car here oh, there is no secret I'm racing this car now for several seasons. That's it. You have to have uh, cockpit time. Currently, I tried the Renault and I was. 
So it's just about practicing. Practice, practice, and practice. That's uh, they say some of the best prep just comes just putting your just getting in the car and driving as much as you can. But Stefan Rosgen wins both races here from the Mid Ohio Sports Car Course and maintains his point lead going into next week. Sponsors, shout outs, anybody you would like to say hello to, Stefan. I want to thank all uh, the guys who uh, run this series. This is really great stuff, and I'm very uh, grateful about it. Well, the driver from Club Diatch gets it done once again. Stefan, congratulations. We'll, uh, we'll see you at Snedderton coming up here in a few weeks' time or so. Yeah, see you then. That's our winner, and now going to pass the mic over to Jack Stiles, who's caught up with the guy who has brought back race number two and is able to get us get his spot back on the podium. Jack Stiles with Yas van der Ven. Yoss, uh, first of all, I just want to... What, what happened in, in race one? Sorry, it just obviously didn't seem to go right to you. We saw a really weird incident in the uh, closing stages coming into the carousel. Yeah, I had uh, problems with the sticking throttle. So uh, my throttle went full uh, throttle. So no way you could break into for the corner. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. And uh, race two, obviously, we saw you back at the front. You finished second, but it wasn't without its fair share of problems. Just take us through what happened. We, we saw you go, I believe it was coming out of turn one. You had a bit of a moment. Uh, well, the only big problem I had was uh, after turn nine, uh, where I uh, had a, sp a spin. Uh, that's also always a difficult uh, corner. You have to manage the throttle uh, well, or else it goes wrong. But uh, I can't remember uh, an incident after turn one. Don't worry, that's just me. We had a lot of incidents at turn one, and I'm getting confused with other people. No, it was it was turn on lap 14 that you had the issue. Just looks as though the car got unsettled on the exit, and you were lucky to keep that out of the wall, actually. Yeah, I had to uh, let John Morgan go by, and... Um, but uh, a lap later, he uh, spun right in front of me, so I got back to the second place. Uh, and I was happy with that, of course. So then, Jos, before I let you go and celebrate with your team, who would you like to thank today? Well, of course, first I'd like to thank all the guys involved uh, uh, organizing this league. Uh, it's a massive um, um, input they have, and... Um, I'm very happy they do that. Um, and secondly, I want to thank my wife for letting me uh, racing all those days in the week. And thank you for the interview. Jos van der Ven, ladies and gentlemen, your second place finishes today here at race two at Mid-Ohio. Now we're going to catch up with the driver who finishes third here from Mid-Ohio, Bill Lawrence. And... Bill, we said, you know, looking at your race, you were just able to just play the consistence card and made everything work out and just kind of let things happen around you. Just ran your race and it worked out. Thanks, Cisco. Yeah, it worked out uh, well this time around. The uh, the first race, I lost it there, I think, with the two laps to go. Silly mistake, but thank you. And it... You looked fast out there. You gained six spots. And, yeah, that first incident, the incident in the first race was really unfortunate. It was going through, I believe, turns number nine, and the car got nosed into the wall. But this race, you come back, and you know you knew you had to get points back, and that's exactly what you did. And how hard is it to kind of follow that game strategy, you know, going into a race with so much pressure, you know, to get those points back and make sure you're towards the top of the table? Well, I was hoping to get the points back, and it is, uh, it's difficult to remain consistent all the time, at least for me it is. And I had a few drivers around me, as usual, who are always pressing hard, so, you know, just watching the F3 there, eight tenths, seven tenths back, and they really only want the one draft to catch up on there, and not many passing opportunities, so a lot of pressure, but yeah, I just sat there, and it came to me. That was nice. Well, Bill, I'll give you a chance. Sponsors, shout out to anybody you want to say hello to out there in TV land. Well, I, I, I think I'll just say uh, thank you to the league organizers and uh, for you guys 
for looking after us here and, and for the league guys for looking after us and for all the racers on 60 plus uh, we've got some great great guys there it's awesome thanks guys that's bill lawrence's finishes final step on the podium bill congrats and we'll see you in snatterson hope to yep thanks that uh, rounds out our coverage for the 60 plus racing adventures before we let you go jack final thoughts here before we leave the land of uh, the Buckeye State. I've seen some very close racing today. Seen some a few incidents and people just struggling with a loose setup by the sounds of it and just not having the car under them. And and obviously we're going to be leaving here, crossing the pond to the home or my homeland, Norfolk, in six weeks' time for the final round of the Six Plus Racing Adventures this season. Yeah, going to be a lot of fun and look forward to that. And if you're interested in joining the league, they're on iRacing, so just look them up. The 60 Plus Racing Adventures, of course, driving for some of the drivers kind of up there in age, but always putting on great action. You can find them on iRacing, and we won't see them until Snetterton. That'll be February 28th. Of course, same time, same place here on Race Spot TV. But for everybody behind the scenes who makes it happen, Will Vincent, of course, as well as Hugo Louise and Esteban Ballo, and of course Anduin Designs for everything overlay and graphical and all that sort of stuff. And of course for the broadcast crew tonight, for Jack Styles, for Hugo Louis and the production truck, my name is Francisco Scaramuza, and this has been the 60 Plus Racing Adventures here from the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. This race and the final, of course, right here on RaceBot TV and iRacing Live. But until then, we'll see you around the turn.